Dear public, it's a joy to be here, even in these difficult times, and to have a debate on music and time. The title of the debate is Not Lost in Music Through Time, on time in improvisation and performance. And while I'm very happy to have those four musicians here, because it's on artistic research in and through music, and for that we need absolutely artists. So uh, I will just shortly present you uh, the four members of this debate. And we have first the pianist and musician Malcolm Braff. And of course, he, is, uh, he has my respect and admiration for his uh, place that he took in the Swiss jazz scene firstly, and then after that uh, on a worldly basis and very intercultural basis. He has a very, very big discography, so you can hear what he did. I will not explain that because it's too much. And what is very nice also is that, well, we have Malcolm Braff here because he's also working in a similar domain as Stéphane Galland, and they work together in uh, some projects together, uh, intercultural projects also on polyrhythmy and um, original uh, folkloric and intercultural uh, rhythms and sounds. And then I come immediately to Stefan. Stefan is an unconventional drummer, I would say, searching with passion for intercultural polyrhythmical ideas. And it's very nice to know that he's currently working on a doctoral thesis on this polyrhythmy concerning the embodied sensorial and intercultural aspects of polyrhythmy and a didactic way to bring this implicit knowledge uh, to musicians and students. And together, well, they deepen their approach and their love for rhythmic in a both uh, organic, artistic and scientific way. Um, then I will go to the next one, and there we have a kind of other duo in classical music. Uh, we have Boyan Vodenicharov. I don't think I have to explain who he is. Um, he is really known for his great, powerful, and sensitive interpretations of classical music. And what is more important also, well, more important in the case here of this debate, is also that he has a passion for improvisation coming out of a classical tradition. And um, he's, so he's one of these rare musicians in classical music that dare to take up uh, improvisation. And so we come to Jan Michiels, who is also um, passionate about, he uh, has a lot of recordings on Beethoven, and he has some fine-tuned timing about how to bring music of different composers together in his, um, in his work, artistic work, in his uh, conferences and in his recitals. And he moves all the way from Beethoven to contemporary compositions. And don't forget, he did a very beautiful uh, doctoral research a long time ago on Teatro dell'Ascolto, on bringing places, spaces, and time in music together. But you will probably hear much more when we start the debate about these um, topics. Um, music is something that happens through time. It's something that happens in time. And time happens through music. Time is in music. And what is a challenge of today is to have these four people together who have, um, in fact, who position spaces in the musical and artistic uh, domain that put together interpretation and improvisation, that put together performance stage and preparation, that put together jazz and classical music. So I propose that we will start a debate and maybe start something on what I call vertical time. And what is vertical time? Well, it's the impact of history and of other spaces and timelines upon the musician. So why, how do we play compositions of previous times in the 21st century, which is qua soundscape, qua technology, qua ideas rather different. So how to render that? And 
then of course we can move towards and the participants on the debate are free to do move that to do that to move to horizontal time what is the idea of time when you are playing how to create a music time what is the time of uh, the moment of being on stage we will talk about that and of course then we can move towards other aspects of time. What is a physical time? What is the time of our body? How does our body respond to time while being in a concert? And what is the impact of mental time? And then you think about just things you are thinking on beforehand, but also the imagination, the moment, the, uh, being in the moment, in um, the power of just having the public listening to you, having this music and the sound that comes back. So. I would rather like to start maybe um, with, uh, well, let's start with Jan about um, performance and time and about this vertical time and maybe that then uh, Boyan can maybe um, contrast or complement those ideas and then we can see how uh, the people more from jazz and intercultural music uh, react to that because that's the important also to have this kind of discussion between classical music and jazz. Thank you, Katrin, for this wonderful introduction. Um, you just talked about Beethoven and there are so many people who compare Beethoven to the big bang of the music history. So let's start with Beethoven. Um, take a sonata of Beethoven also talking to the students of the conservatory. If we try to get in our brain everything that we could know about, uh, let's say, one page of Beethoven. I think everybody who, who gets all the material or even tries to get all the material should be frozen in this activity because we cannot go further, it's just too much. <laughs> not not uh, one person on earth can know everybody, uh, can know everything ab about these pieces. So somehow my um, experience during the years was, um, of course, try to know as much as possible. But um, at the other hand, um, when you work with contemporary composers or composers working today, then often this contact helps you a lot to, to handle this, 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 this older scores. Um, and that has always been uh, um, my point of activity between the two. Um, because it, uh, we should never forget we are talking about Beethoven, let's say it's not written in 1813. But when we play it today, it's a sonata of 2021. And that's not easy to, to, to um, handle, especially with all these recordings, with all these uh, teachers, bad or good or marvelous teachers, who will tell you how to play Beethoven. Um, it remains when you have to play it, it's your bit. And that's not, uh, that's not easy to, to put yourself into per perspective, um, which part of tradition, which part of, of contemporary tradition or old traditions uh, you take into, into your, in your performance. So um, it comes all to a personal choice of perspective, I think. And that's uh, maybe that you can call that personality. Um, but it's also a matter of choice and a matter of teaching as well. And I cannot stress enough, it helps so much, much if you are in contact with contemporary composers. And then at least I'm not a composer, I'm not an improviser. Uh, then you are a little bit more in contact with uh, the actual stuff, how, how music has, has been made. I, I don't know if Boyan has the same opinion. Thanks. Uh, well, my opinion... Is, is the sound okay? Can you hear me? Yeah. My opinion, of course, uh, uh, is somewhat neighboring yours, although I cannot uh, prevent myself from bringing the question of the research on historic instruments and historic perform performance practices, which dealt so much with exactly the organization in time, with what we call timing. And uh, I remember when I heard for the first time recordings of Hanon Kur or Christopher Hogwood, what stoked me was that the form somehow became palpable. I could hear the the tissue of the music. I could hear the harmonic structure. I could hear the uh, tonal organization. And how come, I was asking myself. And then I saw that actually the organization of the phrasing was different. The timing was organized differently. And here the major question, uh, what, what happened? 
what happened was that this organization, which was hierarchical, little by little vanished, roughly around the Second World War, I suppose, and the way of organizing the music in time became a little bit disconnected from the body of what tonality is. The body of what tonality is, is hierarchical. And the, the, uh, the, the, the process of getting rid of hierarchies that, that took place in the beginning of the 20th century changed a lot the perception of, of, the, uh, the, of what language is, what time is, what rhythm is. And we went more to a kind of abstract uh, mathematical vision of time. Like all beats will be equal, all bars will be equal, all notes would be equal, a little bit like the metronome shows us. Which is in total contradiction with what tonality is, because in tonality, in tonal language, similarly like in the spoken language, there isn't equal elements, there is a hierarchy. You don't have equal syllables, you don't have equal words. They're in a constant fluctuation, and there's a constant flow from stable through unstable to another stable, etc., etc. Et and this kind of dynamism of the of the inner behavior of the rhythm was striking when I listened to this, you know, people that I mentioned. And then with the with my own work with ancient instruments and, and working on old styles. I figured out that there's incredible correlation between all the parameters in music, what the harmony is doing, what the uh, dissonance-consonance relationship is doing, how the phrase is organized, how the tonality behaves. All that goes together with the behavior of the rhythm. So it's all one body of hierarchical relations. And we kind of lost that, which is normal, because we, we broke many hierarchies. This is just one among others. And we did it willfully, and I don't think we made a mistake. This was something unavoidable. But of course, we have to pay the consequences. And now that we need to come back to finding our way towards hierarchically organized things, it takes an enormous amount of effort. So it's, it's really uh, not easy to come to terms with Haydn, Mozart, and Bach. And I know I suffered hell of a time when I was in this conservatory because I didn't know how to play them. I played them kind of in regular academical way and I hated it. Then uh, maybe I have illusions now, but I think I do it better now. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, that's interesting because <coughs> now you were just saying that kind of we had to go through that that that, uh, that thing in, in a way to get lost and then maybe find some something else new and and before we started the uh, conference now we were talking about some uh, Bulgarian rhythm because uh, Boyan is from Bulgaria and uh, in, in Bulgaria you have a lot of uh, odd meters like short and long strokes are mixed uh, in a way that that is quite uh, very specific to Bulgaria and we were talking about that that uh, people in jazz were using that more and more but uh, but at first they were saying that that it gave a, a strange feel that it, it was not uh, groovy or swinging or that it was too stiff and because it was too complicated uh, but now we see that uh, more and more it gets in the body maybe we'll talk more about that concept and uh, and it becomes fluent and therefore it, it starts to have sense which maybe in first place could sound like it's just a technical practice that uh, that leads to nothing very interesting and so um, yeah there are a lot of things that are changing through time that maybe in first place are kind of maybe even destroying things but but in the end it brings something new that you can uh, explore more i think for the um, for jazz it is not similar as classical because it's much younger of course and um and the tradition could could be represented by jazz standards that usually people learn 
before they try a new thing or at the same time but uh, but it's kind of a process to go through um, jazz standards but uh, yeah I, I think at one point people need to go and, and try new things that maybe sound completely strange or destroy everything maybe uh, but in the end, th th that's uh, that's also something that I noticed myself. That by uh, trying new things and making things more complex and and going further, at some point you need to go back and sometimes way back. <laughs> so that's why I started uh, listening and studying a lot uh, traditional music from different parts of the world because that's what bring th those new ideas that I was developing more sense and more um, roots i guess so um yeah that's what i could say and uh, malcolm you have something to add <laughs> maybe ah, we don't hear uh, ah, okay we hear you is that everyone hears me great so yeah, I was trying to, to reflect on this concept of a, a vertical time. Um, uh, actually, finally, uh, uh, my intuition, I would swap the two, the two um, uh, you know, the, the two axes, actually, for me, uh, the, the historicity of things, uh, because maybe of the linearity of, of the historical time. Or, so it would be more like horizontal. And for me, verticality speaks for trend transcendence or something so so the flow the moment the present the now would be more like vertical than horizontal so it's it's funny I was like uh, <laughs> a bit uh, confused by the, the, this um, um, verticality here but so back to, to the, the maybe I don't know the historical perspective and I can only speak for my uh, own and very personal and subjective um, experience. Um, I think without uh, willing to be uh, provocative or anything like that, I think that for me, uh, the historical perspective of what I am doing as a performer, as a composer, etc., is irrelevant. I, uh, it's not taken into consideration. Of course, it does participate in what I am as a product of, 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 the, of the past as well. I inherited through my musical journey and the experiences and the things I have been studying and uh, etc. Of course, I inherit uh, from the past, but there's not a, a single moment of the intention to render something from the past in the way I practice uh, music. And um, and it's really very much experience-centered, uh, 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 the way I approach things. So um, once again, embodying the past, but as a natural process, rather than a, a, a research to really embody the past better or more accurately. Or So this debate here, uh, I, I, I never spent too much time trying to consider and, and, and make statements for myself on this uh, subject, on, on how my music relates to history. Actually, my music, and when I say my music, is just me performing. It doesn't mean the music I compose, or it's not a, a uh, it's just the fact that I am playing is enough for me to label it my music. Uh, and then, uh, this music relates as much as possible, and that's my, my, my effort, my work, is that this music, like the me playing, whatever it is that I am playing, that it relates as much as possible with now, with what is now, with how I feel now, maybe the, the, the why not if it has a political uh, um, uh, dimension, uh, but it's the now and not too much the 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 the, uh, the relation the historicity of it or whatever yes I, I think you're right to say i think the um, difference between us classical musicians and, and jazz musicians and 
there, of course, there are many possibilities, but in between. But we have one friend enemy that's very um, difficult to approach, is the score, I think. And, um, and it, we come from a period, the whole 20th century was full of it, uh, of describing music history from scores or from analysis, and it started at the end of 19th century. And uh, still, um, the students present here, um, maybe the lens uh, uh, shot at me, and, and of course I ask also, also them to, to read the score, but I think that that's a crucial point. The scores survived maybe two centuries, but do we read them still as they read it in the beginning of the 19th century? So that's the first thing, how to read the score, and I think like I just said, uh, the score is never the music, so the, the score was always played in a different way, and it's extremely interesting to, to, um, to try to guess from sources how it could have been played then. And, uh, but for me, it's actually still more interesting how they played it 20 years and 40 years and 60 years or and later after the composition. And then that's for me more embodied history, and to be a little chain in that, in that process is, is, is already... Uh, very, uh, very passionate thing to to to, to do. Um, so that's I think the score is actually uh, for me first an, an enemy to conquer uh, to um, that you can try beyond the score because the music is never like one of our famous colleagues here, but the notation is never the music, and that's your great advantage in jazz. Field. You don't have this enemy. Or do you have another enemy? Yeah. I, I think I have the worst, worst enemy, if I may just, just intervene here. Uh, uh, actually, uh, most of the, I mean, the total of the jazz tradition, when, when you try to, to respect the tradition, follow, follow the tradition in jazz, comes from recordings. Uh, at least the score, you can, there are some, the, some vague zones that you can have this freedom to interpret it uh, with your own uh, perspective on it. But, uh, I mean, when you study jazz called train, it's recorded. So it's a much, much more accurate score than the written score, actually, the recording. And this is really terrible uh, as a, 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 this enemy, or I don't remember how you called it, to, to face, because uh, uh, and, and, and some really uh, go this way, which is respectful. I'm, uh, once again, I was talking from my, my own personal experience and expertise and not pretending that the, the, this, this, is a, this is an aesthetic or, or even more a moral question, of course not. But, but to say that in the jazz uh, world, we do have a score that's very, very present and uh, hard to deal with, which is the recording. Yeah, and that's funny because that was the question I wanted to ask. What do you think if uh, those composers had uh, recordings and, uh, and now we could listen to Mozart play? And how, uh, do you think things would be different in interpretation or? I don't think so. But, um, if you go a little bit further, we have plenty of recordings of, of Rachmaninoff. Yes. Nobody plays like him. And he was the best of all, in my opinion. Yes, we have plenty of recordings of Debussy, of Bella Bartok, of Prokofiev, of Shostakovich. It doesn't help. It is, still, it is still extremely difficult to deal with the score because there are things that are coded in the score which we are supposed to uncode using our own musical instincts. Let's not be naive. Knowledge cannot replace the musical instinct. We, are, we have to educate our intuition in order to come up with something that makes sense. So it's, a, it's something similar to like, okay, you, you want to be a jazzer, well, you have to st study how Bill Evans dealt with harmony, you have to study how, Mi how Miles Davis dealt with space, you have to study how Coltrane dealt with spirituality and sonority. In, in, but then at the end of the day, if you don't digest it into your own sound, all this knowledge is just a bunch of information. So in, in jazz, you have to deal with all this tradition which is oral, you, you hear it, but it's again the thing of accumulating principles that have to be metabolized into your own inner intuition. So the score has to turn into your own inner sound image. And this, this is shared between jazz and classical music. 
Just the thing is, it, it's, it's probably equally complicated. If you have to deal with the sound which is there, it's probably even more oppressive than the enigma of the score. And the score remains always something completely uh, repulsive. It's a little bit like our intelligence. It's like a necessary evil. We need our intelligence, but only in order to go beyond it. If, it's, if we are stuck with our intelligence, we cannot do anything decent. Same with the score, you can be extremely exact with your knowledge or your reading and still it will not give sound that makes sense. You need this need to turn into your own personal intuition. I'm just trying to find out. Come on, we're on the floor. Well, um, what I wanted maybe to, 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 to mark the word, the word so um, Boyan, you told about these hierarchical relations, they are lost and that is unavoidable. And what was interesting is that even if you're talking about score, about, um, about recordings, there is another word uh, that Stefan took up, that is roots. And roots is something different than a score, than a recording. It's something that maybe you embody also as an artist by way of your experience. And I take a bit up again the experience of, of, of uh, Malcolm. Maybe that is an interesting element to go to more the idea of the horizontal time in, in the sense that with that I mean how you as a performer, as an improvisator, cope with that moment that you are playing and the moment of preparation, of course, also. Yeah, like about woods, for example, if I, if we talk about uh, pure rhythm, I think there are roots that are common to any, any language. And then uh, I think it's important to understand what are those roots. And I think there are not so many. <laughs> And uh, a lot of time, I think what we see, because the, everything got more and more complex through time, I think. Uh, so, for example, a musician starts uh, studying and playing, and all of a sudden he's already in a very complex world with a lot of information, rhythmical information, and he has to deal with it. And he can play for years and years and never really uh, study those roots. And, and sometimes you can find people actually able to, to do very complex things, but there is still something missing because in those roots there are something that's not uh, clear enough or not strong enough or so uh, so that that's something I, I find very important to to go really deeply what's the a and b of uh, of rhythm for example that is common to everything and and can you deal with that is that uh, understood is there is that clear is that incorporated in your body um, i think especially in classical music because the scores are so complex and so full of information. And most of the time, I think people don't have the time or the opportunity or just the, uh, the, the good advice to just practice a few things to understand the, the very basic, so the roots of, the, of rhythm. And I think that that's super important and that can uh, develop a lot of things and also in the in the connection between old music classical jazz whatever so everything after that got a very uh, complexified i don't know if that's the right word but i think you understand uh, so so you have a lot of things to deal with but at least if those roots are clear and and understood and strong you can deal with it and uh, yeah, so I think the the roots are are something very important. More than a historical root, I would say, um, how could you say, common roots, or... Just human. Just human. Just human. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, well, maybe I, I was thinking that um, when Malcolm was, uh, was talking about, about this idea of experience-centered embodying the now, Malcolm, well, where would you place this idea of roots? Because roots can be something about, can be something conceptual about the roots of the music. But I think here, and that is something very important that was already a bit launched by everybody, that is the roots of your own musicianship and of your own experience. Yes. Um... I tend to uh, believe that, um, of course, uh, the experience each and everyone has of uh, music is uh, personal. That um, that this experience is somehow a sum of many, many, many factors and, and parameters, and and all of these have uh, can be rooted, if you will somewhere uh, in the depth of something and uh, and and they by nature would tend to differ quite a lot from individual to individual that, that's my opinion now uh, when people want to play together um, they need common roots they need a common basis of of the language, where whether it is uh, the culture, the general culture that that we're talking about, or a certain practice of uh, uh, a certain way to approach the, the 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 playing the instrument, or I mean, it's very complex. It's, there's many, 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 many factors involved. Uh, but what will enable people to play together, to exchange, to share this experience of the music? And I think we could even include, the, of course, the, 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 the listeners, the public in that paradigm. Um, um, then there's this necessity of the common ground or, or at least some elements of common uh, roots. And of course, the deeper these common elements are in the construction of the phenomena in each individual, the, the deeper the, 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 the shared experience will be. But I don't think that per se uh, there would be those so-called universal roots or principles of, uh, uh, or maybe it goes really way back to the fact that we have, generally speaking, all of us two legs and two arms, etc. So, I mean, yeah, going to the very, very depths of what makes us very, very similar. But, but otherwise, um, I think uh, the experience of music can, uh, theoretically at least, can be built upon very singular and personal uh, roots. And what will make these things roots is just the fact that it evolved and grew from that point, and then the construction, the the the, the tree-like uh, construction uh, on this thing makes by by uh, by um, a side effect almost this thing be, be a root of of, of this uh, very singular uh, system. I like very much this tree as, as a side effect because I think in at least for the classical world, and it's slowly changing, but I have a little bit the impression that this uh, side effect becomes almost a root for, for many people, a very important thing that, that uh, let's put in other words, in, in classical music world, um, it's also uh, due to the recording, com the recording process during the competitions, perfection has been a norm, uh, it has become a norm. Uh, we have to play perfect. And that's the best way to, to to, 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 to forget these rules, I think if uh, Stefan was talking about this basic and going also about the rhythm side, the first thing I'm, I'm thinking about is about breathing, and it's, it's something we, we all do. So, in fact, I'm so naive to believe that everybody could become a musician if, if he or she has the, the right neighborhood to, 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 to be nurtured by, by somebody or some, some um, environment. So, and that's, in classical music world, that's for me a b big danger, that this, this breathing is slowly coming back, but it, it, it's, it's disappearing more than it's showing up. And so that, that's why this image of the tree, we always see the stars, and the, the, I mean the real uh, uh, music stars, and 
this blinky blinky of the music world without without um, uh, really realizing where music comes from, and that's why I always refer again to composers. Um, performance without composers um, are non-existing. Yes. I think uh, it would be still interesting to have your point of view on this idea of roots, because you were the one also who stressed the most also these uh, performance practices, authentic performance practices. So maybe yeah. it can be interesting to have uh, this. I will join Malcolm in the idea that this is profoundly personal phenomenon, the, the question of roots. But of course, we all know that there are also cultural aspects of it, and we are all kind of being, possessing individual consciousness, whatever consciousness means, we don't know. And we're still, we're also, um, we can also be considered as having collective consciousness. We all know that consciousness cannot evolve by itself. If we don't participate in a collective consciousness, we die, we don't develop consciousness. Uh, so I would just, you know, now it crosses my mind. I grew up with uh, Bach preludes, preludes and fugues, with Mozart sonatas, with uh, listening to Chick Corea, who left us sadly recently, with listening to Bill Evans, etc., etc. I wasn't listening to Bulgarian folk music, although it was only present. But I remember that there was this moment where a Bulgarian folk song was passing on the radio and it moved me tremendously but it's like something that you have seen many times why at this particular moment it decided to move me I have no answer at all this is something inherited it's something genetic <laughs> cultural genetics so uh, I would just say that of course uh, our emotional memory retains all sorts of things and this is actually our roots the things that we fell in love, consciously or unconsciously, all the way through our evolution as, a, as persons, as artists, this creates not only our roots, but it creates our filter of what we like and what we dislike. But there are also enigmatic things that we don't know where they are from. I don't know why I was so moved by the interpretations of Harman Kuri at this particular moment. This changed my life. I always had terrible suffering with ancient styles, I thought that we cannot do them, that it's lost, that we have gone completely berserk, that we're doing idiotic things on them, that just lost them. And then, no, no, we can find a way. And then it sounds like old music sounds like being done now, today. I think it's also not only the, the phenomenon of roots, but the phenomenon of what is now. Now is a constant exchange between past and future and it's constantly evolving. And it felt like Beethoven and Mozart were, what I heard sounded like being done now. It didn't sound like a museum exponent, but I went a little bit far from, from astray from the, from the topic. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to add that our roots are equally personal and Collective. That, in a certain way, so that it's no problem that we don't follow the, the order or that, that we could have done. But this brings us in a certain way to what, what I called a bit in the preparation, the mental time, in fact, of you all as musicians. And I just by talking about personal collective consciousness, the filter, I was thinking about three kinds of words that could be very important. That is imagination, expectation, and remembrance. And I don't know if these words link immediately to your experience, but I, I felt this comes really near to this, um, this idea of, of going in a time that is a, a music time that is personal, that is collective, that is very uh, rich, in fact. Boyan, can I just ask you to hold yeah, the mic sorry. a bit uh, nearer? Well, Stefan gentiment m'a passé le micro. I passed the mic because it, 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 somehow I reacted spontaneously because it was just this idea that it was present in the last sentence I said. Expe imagination, expectation, and remembrance. Yes. 
I think that's the whole circle about the emotional memory filtering our choices, our decisions. Do we do decisions when we play? No. We have no time to make decisions. It's our emotional memory who creates this filter who is guiding us. We listen, we, the, sound, the sound is guiding us, but how do we relate to the sound? Through our li lived experiences. So there is the completely direct link between the memory of the experiences that we have stocked in our emotional memory, which creates the decision filter. We don't decide, but as Keith Jarrett says, I'm always surprised to see what my left hand knows. And I see that it knows more than me. <laughs> this is the, 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 the <laughs> this is the the baggage of the emotional memory having retained millions of things. They're there somewhere, and the uh, the expectation would be our readiness to go for it, and the imagination is the tool to follow up. If our imagination is not plugged in, if our to be scientific the right hemisphere is not active we cannot c communicate with our emotional memory that retained all these uh, elements that are guiding us. We will not even understand what the sound tells us if our imagination is not switched in. So it's a completely circular process, makes us think a little bit as uh, uh, Jan suggested this amazing book by uh, Carlo Rovelli, The New Direction of Time, where, where Rovelli speaks about the present being a constant oscillation between the past and the future. This is like explaining what making music is all about. It's a constant oscillation between kind of a communication between the imagination supposing and the memory re having retained things. And they nourish each other in a circle. And in, in improvisation, I think that's the number one thing. That's the, the, the if you don't have that, you cannot. Jan, maybe what would be interesting also is you have a lot of, you use one tool very often to give this imagination, to offer this imagination. If I'm not wrong, it's the idea of a metaphor. Also the Teatro de la Scolto, also the idea of uh, time with Proust, so such kind of ideas you take to the, nourish that. The title Teatro de Ascolto refers to um, the opera by Luigi Nono, Tragedia de Ascolto, uh, written at the end of the 20th century, and that deals mainly about um, how difficult it is for us to listen, actually, not only to music, also to each other, by the way. It's very difficult to listen really to somebody without having always your own opinion interfering. And that's why I just talked about this, the, the score as an enemy. So one of the, of the tools, what Kathleen just um, um, she says, um, I'm using is confronting scores. And then very often um, you see, of course you can see it like a musicological tool to, to see what's similar, what's not similar. But in the act of listening, if you put, for instance, uh, simple examples, uh, DPC etudes to Ligeti etudes. Um, I had already in concerts experience that people were thinking that DPC etudes were Ligeti and Ligeti was DPC. So, and if I refer to um, the wonderful book, The Order of Time of Carl Rovelli, you should all read it if you haven't read it yet. He starts with, um, um, it's in three chapters. Um, first, he demolishes time as, as we know it because that's, uh, I think it's one of the first chapters. The universal now just doesn't exist. Your now, your now is another now that, than mine. Then the second chapter is pure about quantum physics where he explains how it, how it functions on that, on that level and that's for me already very difficult to follow but he, he, he manages to, to explain even for non-physicians uh, uh, non in a very clear way. But the third chapter is the most touching because there Rivoli, Rovelli, as a scientist, like Bojan just told, said in very beautiful sentences, uh, tried to describe the, the mystery of art making and the mystery of listening to music. And that's, that's oscillating between now and past and in between that the universal time just doesn't exist. And that's maybe the mental time you were talking about. 
it's not from one to three, it's from three to one or something beyond. Um, so that's why, and that's why where Proust intervenes, of course. Uh, I think if one writer in the 10th century was a master of the illusion of now and then and past, it was Marcel Proust. But I still didn't finish his book, but I'm still <laughs> fascinated. <laughs> Stefan, yeah, imagination, expectation, <laughs> memory, and then... Yeah. I forgot all about it. <laughs> 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 no, but uh, the, uh, the, that, like what you talk about, that uh, there's no time and things happen in the moment sometimes. It's so amazing in improvisation. I think you, you can experiment that so clearly that it's very striking. And uh, I had a lot of time uh, after some concert. I, I would think about it and and think like, how is it possible that we all did that thing all together? Even I remember once uh, playing with a DJ, uh, and we were improvising. And at some point, we, we made a just a, a very short break in the music, and he, he sent. Uh, some words from a record. Uh, I don't remember now what it is, but but it was so perfect uh, for the situation, and he couldn't, he could never have um, anticipated that because he was playing with vi vinyls. He should have taken the vinyls, find the right place, and uh, and so a lot of things like that happen where you say, yeah, the. the or the way you react to improvisation or what's happening in a band, it's, uh, it's totally out of the time as we know it. It's, uh, it's impossible just to react that fast or right on the moment to things that are happening. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's about that um, flow. I think you're talking about it also in, in your yes. paper, that once you get in a flow, it, it, there's something out of space and time and and things happen just the way it should be. Now, how to get in that flow? That's the question. <laughs> Malcolm, uh, I know you have the answer. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, um, what I, I, I can say about this... Um, uh, those three words, so so imagination, expectation, that somehow come together, imagination, expectation, and uh, and memory. Uh, so remembering um, is that uh, somehow they do not, as Boyan say, they do not participate truly or consciously to the experience of the performance, and um, and of course uh, the. the what music is in the life of a musician, in the daily life of a musician, of course, uh, um, uh, comprises much more than just the playing or the performing uh, experience. There's the compos composing for the composers, there's the preparation, the, the, pra the instrumental practice, there's uh, the business aspect of it, the communication, the, the, the teaching, the, I mean, music, uh, the way music interferes with our personal lives as musicians is in many, many, many ways. Yet, uh, for me, the core, the, the center, the, the important part of it for me personally, is the performing, is the playing, is the instrumental thing like I play. This is where it kind of really happens, or at least that it's this moment that everything uh, leads to. Uh, this is the moment that, that matters. And in this moment, there is no space left for imagination, expectation, nor remembering. Because when one of these happens, it fucks up. I'm sorry for the word, for the French word. Uh, um, <laughs> it, it doesn't work. You're out of the experience. You're out of, uh, you know, and it's even hearable. So, um, so for me, imagining, uh, expecting, remembering are indeed um, uh, concepts that are very, very much active, 
but more in in the side um, um, room is like preparing it's like okay when I, when i'm when i'm practicing when when i so me as an improviser what i am preparing what i am constructing working on so i would say my artistry actually is more so my artistry is not about playing okay because when i play i'm not an artist i don't have time for this when i'm playing my artistry is when i prepare and so to some extent, uh, um, when I'm when I'm performing, I am not an artist. I am the piece of art itself okay, that I have been preparing before. The me playing is what I shape, is what I work on. And yes, with expectations, memories, uh, fantasy, imagination, projections, construction, etc. But but those words for me they belong to a time of the music musicianship experience that is not the center, the core of what music is for me, which is playing music. I don't know if I, uh, uh, I could That's make... Uh, I like the fact of being a piece of art. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what then happens, and then maybe we should come to some kind of mastery, some kind of embodiment, some kind of loops of feedback interaction, and I want to ask it a bit specifically to the improvisers here, both in classical music as in, uh, in jazz. What then happens to come in this flow and to be the piece of art? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that's a lot of um, preparation that can be very diverse, of course, uh, but, um, but there is a lot of things to integrate so that so that when uh, you're in the flow things can materialize or things can happen so that's i think that that's uh, joined what we were saying about yeah uh, imagination and uh, is that whatever you have in mind you got to know what you will need for that to happen um, because if you are limited uh, in many ways, uh, yeah, the, the the expression of that will be also limited. So I think it's important to to understand uh, what uh, what you want to create, what kind of tools you need to develop, and how to integrate them so that it's part of you and not something you have to think about. Uh, that that's. That's join again what uh, I was saying in the beginning about the Bulgarian rhythm that that can be complex. That's something, for example, I really like that uh, those uh, new meters. I would say it's not new, but uh, in jazz it, it's still quite new. But how to how to make that your own? That it becomes natural. That you don't have to think about it or or count because that's. Yeah. As long as you count, you have no freedom. So uh, you, uh, the whole process is to how to find a way to uh, integrate whatever complexity or whatever ID you can have to get ready for that flow when, uh, when it's the moment. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of practice for that, I think. And the way to practice it, I think, is very important. Because you can practice in a way that, that you're always thinking and always staying in, in that uh, very Cartesian mind. Or there's a way to practice so that this, this uh, very uh, analytic and technical uh, aspect can go through something that's really in your system and can, can be uh, a new tool. I think that that's uh, you. You can play with what you have from uh, from the beginning, from when you were born, or what you got from your education and, and environment. But then your um, imagination can get you much further than that. And uh, so, what what do you do when uh, when you don't have those tools? So that's the that's the thing. How to understand 
that and develop them, I think. Yeah, I would join these two opinions immediately, like the, the one that Malcolm shared, that when we are actually playing music, performing music, there is no time for that. There is no time for remembrance, imagining. It's a, it's a process which is much quicker and much more intense than thinking. Any sort of analytical thinking will, will block it. It's valid not only for improvisation. I think playing a classical piece uh, would suffer also from, inter from the analytical thinking intervening. This will block the listening process. Somehow the listening process is much quicker than the thinking. Probably because it's guided by the behavior of the sound and not of our will or of our conscience. <laughs> much more inspiring thing to do, to be guided by the behavior of the sound than by your own will and your own conscience that you're tired with all your life. And, and the other thing that um, I want to share was the, the thought that you have to work it out, what Stefan said, you have to practice. It, if you want to be ready to follow what the sound comes up with, you have to have this enormous uh, you know, uh, vocabulary that permits you to, to follow. Not only to follow, but to understand first. First, to understand what's going on. You need to have been there. You, you need to know it, to recognize it. And then to be re able to respond, you have to, you have to have been there. You have to have, have, have experience with, with that. And it's, this is work, you know. but work only to be forgotten when you're on the spot. The work shouldn't be there then. To, to the way I see it, it's always somehow the sound that decides. I always thought that when we try to impose our will on sound, it doesn't obey. So somehow sound doesn't care about our concepts. We, we need concepts, I know, but let's be honest, our concepts never last long. They, sooner or later they turn into dogmas and they begin to be counterproductive. And who will save us from this listening to sound? It will tell us new story every time we listen to it. But how to listen to sound, that just takes all your lifetime. And what listening to sound. There's so many things about it. But, you know, uh, <laughs> um, yes, I'm not an improviser, so, but uh, I think I fully agree what Boyan just said about um, having the tools ready is not about just about scales and on the piano, uh, but all the other tools. Um, how to, um, to refer to Harnon Kour, I'm, I'm very glad he was the first one to pronounce the word, but because uh, my students always start a lot, and I start about Harlan Kool. I think he was immensely important for our generation. But he's, he told once in the beginning, if uh, in 50 years, and I think it was in the 80s, he said, they're not starting to laugh when they hear my recordings. There is something rotten in this republic. <laughs> and I think he's right. And I'm s having fear that he, they, will, they won't laugh. <laughs> and, and things are not changing enough. Uh, it's it's very normal that that the, the listening to to sound has to change with times. We we, we cannot, of course, we cannot stop this. It's a very natural phenomenon, and, uh, and that's why I think uh, we should be. Um, the the and that's why I think also Nono wrote his opera, listen to sound, listen what really happens, stop what you want to happen or what you think you should happen. And that's that's what's happening most in the conservatories. Uh, we are. T um, the students are often thinking, what should I do? Should it sound like that instead of being connected with or Even if it's two, three sounds, what, what they are doing for their own. If that is convincing, then they, they can go on. And so we can go on with other words, but it's, we are totally agree, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think there is one thing in which we can come back, that is when we talk about flow, when we think about no analytical thinking while playing, there is something, and you know a bit, it's also a bit the focus of my research, it's about this embodied and sensorial action. In fact, it's about action, about a kind of interaction, be it with the sound, be it with the space, be it with the instrument, be it with the other musicians. So 
how about that? I would. I think you all have a very. You take also very uh, strong positions in in that sense. Maybe would be interesting also for the public to hear a bit more about uh, about this. Yeah, I think the <clears throat> the body aspect, especially for rhythm, I think it's um, a great tool. <laughs> like, for example, um, I know that when I want to integrate some polyrhythm, li like just even two different rhythms that are regular, I tend to to make very big motion, so that. So that for me, it's easier to understand the, um, the regularity of each rhythm. Because you, you can play a polyrhythm very strict like that, or you can make a, a whole motion that's, that's, a, that's something by itself. That's a whole motion. So when you can get two different whole motions like that, the body understands uh, very well the, that, uh, that polyrhythm. And it helps a lot to integrate it and not to think anymore about oh, how, how does a five fits over a seven or things like that. <clears throat> so I think that's very important to, um, to try to understand the body motion of each rhythm, especially, uh, for example, for, uh, to come back again on <laughs> Bulgarian rhythm. Uh, but any, any kind of... Uh, uneven pulse, I think it's important to experiment it in the body to understand, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, the, uh, a short and long could be just, just a different, uh, higher and bigger motion. So you don't think anymore on one to one to one to three, you just think of sh uh, a small one, a small one, a bigger one, and uh, and, and that makes it more concrete, in a way, to integrate. And, and that gives some, uh, yeah, something more human <laughs> and easier to... It's not just a concept anymore. And uh, now I just remember one lesson that I had when I was, I think, 14, with Dre Palemart, who, who is a, a very good jazz drummer in, in Belgium. He teaches in, in Paris. And uh, he was teaching us the swing, you know, ding, 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 ding. That's a particular thing that, that's not ternary, that's not binary, it's something in between, and, and that's kind of hard to get uh, when you're not used to it. And uh, his, his way to approach it was to just throw the stick and let it bounce. And then when you get used to that, after three, three bounces, you lift it up. And then you had that. And, uh, and I thought that was really nice to get uh, in, in that dimension where it's not anymore that uh, analytic brain that has to, oh yeah, but is it a triplet or is it a 16 nose or is it? No, it's in between. And for that, uh, Malcolm Braff is probably the, the best. Uh, <laughs> In, in, that, uh, in that aspect, because he d developed a whole system uh, that's, that he calls morphing, and that's about those states in between uh, rational uh, subdivision of, of uh, the beat. And all that has also a very strong link with the body and, and the way people dance, because I think just the natural um, forces like gravity uh, makes something irregular, you know? When you jump, it, it's not doing this. It, it's like... It's, it's like a fast, slow, so fast. And, uh, so, so everything has some curves like that. So when you dance, you naturally have something that's always curved. And the curving of, of uh, time is what makes groove, like, like you call it. So when, uh, when it's not um, mathematically equal. And uh, I think, yeah, the body can help a lot uh, to understand. And phrasing is, is uh, a perfect example, too. I, on the drums, it's like that. But I think 
yeah, on piano or whatever instrument, because the piano has also needs a lot of uh, motion, right? Uh, the drums even more. So when you want to phrase on the drums, you got to understand where is the beginning, where is the end, and how to prepare each stroke one after the other, and that that makes a whole difference in the in the sound. Uh, so I think the body is uh, is our best friend to understand all that. Malcolm, you want to? Yes, I actually. Uh, uh, I think, uh, Kathleen, with your with your question, you're getting to uh, uh, what for me would be the point, like the center of, of the thing. And you mentioned the body, and uh, I'd like to just uh, uh, react on something Boyan said before. Um, uh, you said uh, Boyan guided by the sound, and it reminds me of a an exercise or something I teach to my students when it comes to rhythm, when it comes to um, trying to be metronomic, like to have a regular pulse feel. Rather than having a, a clock inside that you're trying to follow, I suggest that, that students on the piano would go for the sound of the piano because the note has an envelope. It goes like, wow, there's this sound that is, li is a linear thing, is not a segmented thing, right? It's, it's an it's a, a analog uh, continuum, a continuous thing. And then that they sync to this sound, trying to, re to reproduce that sound again and again. So down, down down and there comes rhythm and regularity so that the, even in rhythm even regularity in rhythm can come from the sound itself rather than a metronomic thing that i have inside that dictates that would be the rule that would be what i predecided that this is right and correct and then as you say boyan then you miss the point because the sound is suggesting you something else and you're not able to to follow so um, for me, this, this points to the, the fact that the, the physicality, the, 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 so the body, is really the center of this musical experience. And then when it comes to the flow, to this presence, to the now uh, kind of thing, to this uh, meditational experience that playing is about, or this, this thing, once we stated that, yes, this is what we value, and this is what we're looking for, then... I guess the body is the key to enter this flow. Um, and um, I would say there are two, and then of course, back to the work, to the practice. Uh, of course, one needs to practice and, and work a lot um, so that the body um, is, becomes this easy access and key to, to the flow. And I think that would be two almost like opposite directions here. One way is to try to embody things that are not yet of the body. And this is typically uh, working on a piece uh, where there are some technical uh, challenges, etc. And so by practicing, and this is pretty much uh, whether it is that, um, I'm, uh, okay, I'm looking for a new technical challenge from an improviser's uh, point of view, or whether I'm I'm trying to to play a composed piece with, which is challenging, then I will by repeating this again and again um, 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 mindfully, uh, I will then embody this, and then it becomes part of the language of the body, and then yes, I can use the body as a key to this uh, flow or presence to the moment. And the the other direction, I would say is complementary, of course, also, is to, rather than, than embodiment of something, is to look for the expression of the body itself, which means, and this, in every uh, instrumental practice, there's always this part of, okay, but I mean, I have small hands on the piano, or, you know, it's, I cannot play like my, my Koi Tyner because I have smaller hands, or up, etc. So, 
um, we have our own morphology and and but beyond that the body itself has its own dance its own dynamics etc and one way uh, this uh, body intuition or body as a easily access to this state that the flow is about i i think it is also paying attention to what the body is saying and finding ways to amplify it or 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 or, or make it more uh, uh, fluid or accessible or yeah to, to to stretch this expression of the body this this dynamics of the body that are even in very tiny small muscular tensions or release etc present and then that one can work on as easing the expression of that um, so i think embodiment and expression of the body are the two opposite um, directions that one can work on and sometimes some really uh, um, focus more on one side and almost not on the other and some try to create a balance and i guess it, there's a room for every kind of experience here but i would say those would be the two directions that can help work towards this accessibility to the flow because i truly fundamentally believe that uh, the body is the key to access this presence to to the moment of the performance thank you I like very much this idea of music as a dance of the body. I just maybe just uh, some last reflections from the classical music musicians, because of course the body is less free or not maybe. Oh, don't say that, please. Okay, well, that's, that's sad, what I wanted that's to, a sad to launch. That's but it shouldn't be less free, <laughs> ideally. <laughs> it is less free for a very simple reason that we don't, we classical musicians, often don't direct our body towards the essential things. Like if you, if you take an average student, what is his body doing usually stopping on every beat to make sure that it's playing correctly? It's enough to, to tell the students, could you connect your body with the harmonic rhythm, with the changes of the harmony? He tries like it takes two, three minutes. And then everything changes just because the body is simply a prolongation of our intelligence. Another body behavior stimulates another mental attitude. <laughs> they begin to listen to the harmony, the body is conducting, and then the, the listening is It's absolutely phenomenal, and I think it's, uh, that's something that we need to rediscover, the, the, um, the fact that the body is the prolongation of our intelligence, because for centuries it had been considered very differently. You know, like, Almost the body's vulgar, you know. It's just <laughs> just one uh, last thing. No, forget. <laughs> so turning to the body, I let be again be an advocate of the contemporary music because if we talk about contemporary music, the first image that comes up to many people, oh, that's intellectual, that's very complicated, that's unplayable, but there, there comes a body in. Um, if you see a very complicated, uh, com let's say, Ligeti etude, there is nobody on the world who can control every note he plays when he plays a Ligeti etude. There's all, always a moment where you have, you have to practice very hard, and not, it's also with, with Ligeti, it's always about harmony, but also about texture. Mm -hmm. But there is a moment where you have to let your body go and, and let the, 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 the muscle me memory, the finger memory, your oral memory, let it go and then you, you get to the music. And if you, uh, after five ligati, you, you turn to the Hammerklavier Sonata of Beethoven, it's much easier. <laughs> okay. Um, is there somebody who wants still to add something? Malcolm, Stefan? I think we started with music and time. We ended by the dance of the body. Harmony leads the body and let your body go. I, well, I will still open if there are some questions here of the public, but I hope that all our, all our students will listen to this very interesting talk in which I think we had a very important aspects of musicianship 
over the differences between improvisation and interpretation, over the differences between jazz and classical music. So I open the floor for five minutes to the public. Do you have some questions to one of these musicians? Please. And maybe we have to pass, pass the... Um, how do you deal with like um, uh, physical injuries with uh, the, 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 the fact that you translate one emotion into your own instruments that maybe like, actually I'm feeling like a, a back pain, not, not a real pain, but like a, um, something stressed on my, like on my shoulders. How do, should I like react to my musical purpose? How should I be like to to be less focused with uh, an injury and be more into music because it's it's uh, I'm playing drums and it's it affects my sound it affects my feeling when I'm playing and I'm thinking about that so I don't really know how to go through that and how to because I've been lately using like bigger motions <laughs> to uh, embody more the. Um, the, 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 the muscular, thing, muscular thing that are going through my body, but I'm still struggling to know if uh, it leads to uh, more freedom or if it's leading just to caring too much about a lot of uh, new elements in my body. Uh, but but do you mean that you got hurt because you were doing two big motions or? No, uh, no, I didn't. I didn't got hurt, but uh, I feel like I'm, I'm playing some snare drum etude, mm -hmm. and uh, I try to get rid of uh, rigidity. Mm -hmm. But then uh, by doing bigger motion, I I lack of control, mm -hmm. and I tend to drop the stick as much as I can, but. Mm -hmm. Right now, I, I feel like it's uh, not giving me, it gives me a, a rounder sound, but it gives, it, it's, it, uh, it, um, I lack of control, and I, have, I lack of control of my own sound. Yeah, well, <laughs> maybe you, you, <laughs> you have things to answer, but yeah, when, once you have injuries, then yeah, everything is fucked up, like, Malcolm would say. <laughs> uh, so yeah, th that's a, that's a problem that needs to be fixed, I guess. And I don't know what you can do exactly about that. But um, about that that question of <coughs> being uh, more relaxed and more loose and uh, losing a bit of uh, control. That's uh, that's normal. <laughs> I mean, uh, that's that's a way I think we all have to go through. If you want to control everything from the beginning, then you get too too tense and too too controlled. Then you make less mistake maybe. But if you uh, if you loosen up everything and and if you leave much more freedom in the beginning, it, it's going to be uh, yeah out uh, a lot of time. But but you get to another level where you find that control that will be way more uh, solid in the end. Uh, that's my uh, own experience. Uh, Malcolm has Malcolm, to yeah. say. Yes, I would have a, I would have a suggestion um, just for the experiment. So not pretending, although uh, I won't lie to you, I do pretend. So, but not pretending that this is the aim uh, of what you want to be expressing. So, but just as an experiment, uh, give a chance to the following. Practice, play, focusing strictly on your injury, on your body, on how it feels, on, and not uh, I'll give up for a while on any sound projection that you have. What is, uh, I believe, uh, I've seen it many times and even in, within my, uh, my own experience, what is generating the tension 
is the contradiction of what the body has a reflex of doing and what you project and expect as a sound result. And what I suggest is that you try to experience the act of playing cut, I know this sounds horrible for, for a musician, cut from any um, judgment on the sound result. So it's not about doing sound, it's about just experiencing the body in action with the movements involved in the playing that uh, the way it should be. And so consider the sound result as a side effect of your body dancing on the instrument. And when I say dancing, is the tiny, small movements, whatever it takes is, no, I'm not talking about African dance, it's just the body in motion, I describe this as a dance on the instrument, and the sound will be a side effect, the resulting sound would be a side effect of that dance on the instruments, at least for a while, and then you can focus, you can become aware, conscious of what are the moment, the movements, uh, where are the stiffness, where, where is the release, where is the relax, uh, what, what the movement is about. You can try to amplify, just be in that dance strictly, in that body consciousness strictly, and then see after a while how you can come back to sound control and, and, and all this. I believe uh, it could be a way, um, because I have experienced it myself, uh, and also with some students, it could be a way to get rid of the, this unnecessary tension that you go, that you generate again and again with your, um, with the way it's set up, you know. Okay, thank you. Is there one other question or we close this? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, ask. So online, you can ask your question. So Last one. Please, if there is one great question online, then we will hear it from you. Okay, well, maybe it can be an after question that can be sent by email to you all. I would like to thank Malcolm, Stefan, Boyan, Jan. I think it was a very interesting debate, and I hope we will have more of these in the future. And I wish also all the students that were listening um, a very interesting continuity of this research week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.